بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعاشرهن بالمعروف وقال الله تعالى هن لباس لكم وأنتم لباس لهن وقال الله تعالى ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون وعن النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم أنه قال أربع من سنن المرسلين الحياء والتعطر والسواك والنكاح أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم First of all, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the ability to come for Isha Salah and pray our Isha Salah with Jama'ah and after Isha Salah to sit for a short while to listen to the words of Allah, to the, listen to the words of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and also to give us the ability to spare some time whereas many of us around in our own area have other plans that we might be busy at home, they might be busy, have, might have gone out to eat, etc. But alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought us to sit in his house for a short while. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this. We show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this ability. The topic for today, as you know, is about marriage. How can we prepare for marriage? How can we deal with marriage, marital problems? And also for those who are married, how can we maintain and have and gain a successful marriage. Alhamdulillah, Mufti Abdul Rahman Sahib Mangera, who, is who has traveled from London, has been in this field for over 20 years, and for over 20 years has been dealing with such problems in the UK, in America, in South Africa, and also he has authored a book by the name of um, um, Handbook of a Healthy Muslim Marriage, inshallah, which also be on sale after the program. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this program a means of salvation for us in this world and also in the hereafter. And also, we, you know, we say Jazakallah to Mufti Sahib for coming and sharing with us the words of wisdom. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept his khidmat. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep him safe and secure and to keep his shade over us. So I would like to ask Mufti Sahib to come forward, inshallah. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil alameen Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi Wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran Ila yawm al-deen amma ba'd Qala Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala Fi al-Qur'an al-Majid wa al-Furqan al-Hamid Wa laqad arsalna rusulan min qablik Wa ja'alna lahum azwajan wa dhurriya Sadaq Allah al-Azim Dear brothers and whoever else is listening, wherever they're listening, dear ulama, and uh, the preparation for marriage, I mean, there's so much you can discuss in marriage, and just to get to the point, there's so much you can discuss in marriage. Today, I'm going to focus on how to prepare for marriage. So those of you who are not married, sorry, who are married, you can probably leave because it's about preparation for marriage. Um, to be honest, while it's about the preparation for marriage, inshallah, this will be relevant to all of us. Okay? Whether you're married, whether you're not married, or whether you, whether you want to be married again. Whatever combination that's in. The reason it's going to be relevant is because I think this is where the crux of the problem is. Uh, I've been married, alhamdulillah, for over 23 years dealing with marital problems for about 20 years and finally decided that maybe, I'm, maybe I should just write a book. Now to write a book, you, you can't be hypocritical. People are saying, why don't you write a book on bringing up children? I don't think I'm qualified yet. I've got a 23-year-old and a 20-year-old and then some younger ones. And I feel that after I've got the older two married, when they've been married off and they, inshallah, gain some stability at least for two years into the marriage then maybe I'll be competent enough to say okay maybe now I can write a book because until then it is such a difficult deed 
bringing up children is a very, very difficult game. We ask Allah for success in this. But in marriage, wrote it because there's just so many issues and so many recurring issues. So I wrote the book and before I published it, before it went to the printers, I tried to send the book to many, many readers of different types of backgrounds. Just so that I'd rather hear the criticism beforehand. Once your book is printed, published, then people create, then you can't change it, then you have to wait for a next edition. So I'd rather send it out and anybody who says, MashaAllah, wah wah, wonderful book, I don't send it back to them, back to any other book back to them. You don't want praise. You want, where are the problems? How can you improve this? So, actually I sent it to more women than men. Alimas, non-alimas, professions and so on. Because I'm not a woman, never been a woman, and never will be a woman inshallah. Right? And as men, we just don't understand women. And women don't understand men. They think they do, and we think we understand men, but we actually don't. They're totally different planets. So I wanted to make it relevant to women as well, because that is what makes a marriage, men and women together. So one reader, one pre-publication reader, he was, he was actually a, ma a man who was doing his PhD. He said, you haven't discussed premarital counseling. So like, what do you mean premarital counseling? We're suffering with in marital counseling. You know, there are so many problems in nikahs, in marriages. There are people getting married after 20 years, of, sorry, there are people getting divorced after 20 and 30 years of being married. Right, midlife crisis problems and all the rest of it. We need counselors for that. Because, and counselors are in short supply, good counselors. There are lots of counselors out there, mainstream ones. But they're not sensitive to the Muslim background and they're not sensitive to our cultural background. And regardless of what anybody says, culture is very, very much part of our life. I'll explain that a bit later if I don't remind me. Right? Um, in my lectures, I, I promise things and then I forget about them. So I'm just going to make you the registrar right, to remember this stuff. How old are you behind you? How old are you? Yeah, you. Huh? You're 12. Are you ready for marriage? Or did your father tell you that you must sit and listen to this? Bayan. Anyway, we're going to try to make it relevant because this is very important. In fact, in Glasgow, I gave this talk and somebody said, how then can we prepare our children for marriage? So it's very relevant. Anyway, so what was I saying? He said, premarital counseling. I said, like, we're suffering with, we're, we're, we're struggling for in marital, post marital counseling, you're talking about pre marital counseling, you're not even married yet, and you have to go for counseling, what are you talking about? And subhanallah, while this is what I'm going to speak about to you today is actually extra content, it's not in the book. This is exclusively for you, right? It's not in the book, it's something that's occurred to me afterwards. And I think it's actually more important than so many other things. How do you prepare for marriage? So that's a question I'm going to ask, and we're going to try to get some answers today. How does one successfully, properly prepare for marriage so that the marriage goes well? So, let us take a step back. How many of us are married here? That's about, 20, uh, about 30, 40, 30, 30, 40%. And maybe, so maybe 40, 50, and then 50 are not married or looking to get married again or whatever that is. Um, if you think back to when you're about 16, 17 years old, that is the first time the seeds of marriage are planted in your mind, generally by an auntie or an uncle. If you remember that, it's like, you know, you need to get married. We need to find somebody for you. You're getting big enough now. Do you remember that time? You remember it, right? And you get butterflies in your stomach maybe? Yeah. So. That's the first. So now what happens is once the seed is planted and it finds a place in our mind, we then start to idealize the spouse that we would be looking for. Like this is how I'd like somebody. It's very vague, it's still a shadow. It's just visualization, right? Nothing solid because I'm 17 years old, 18 years old. My parents aren't gonna really let me get married. You know, maybe they might, you know. As that carries on and then you actually become of proper age, cultural age or social age or whatever to get married and you start, you find someone. Now the second phase of preparation for marriage kicks in. 
Now, this is the interesting phase. Now, think about it. For men, they would, the, uh, the primary thing they have to focus on, and they generally will focus on about preparation, is that am I going to have the income? Do I have the financial capacity? Do I need a house? Where am I going to uh, reside with my wife? From the woman's perspective, they're generally thinking about is it going to be in-laws? What kind, you know, and so on and so forth. But that's about it. Then when you actually fix the date or you found the person, then the entire preparation becomes focused on the days of marriage. Meaning the day of the nikah, the walima, whatever. Now, the entire focus, if you've got fixed and your marriage is in six months, nearly every weekend becomes a shopping weekend. Where'd you go for that? Wally range? Where'd you go? Where'd you do your marriage shopping? Your wedding shopping? Don't you shake your head. Tell me, man. Huh? You go Wally Range. I asked the guys in Scotland, they go Lahore. Right? Some people go Leicester. Right? Huh? Is it Bradford now, is it? To Bradford. Maybe Dubai is a good place as well. Right? Anyway, every week nearly becomes a shopping week. That's why the best marriages get it fixed up in like three weeks. They only have to focus, concentrate, everything in two weeks, done and dusted. Right? So the whole focus becomes then the guest list. How many people are we going to invite? If I invite him, I have to invite his brothers and sisters, otherwise, karab lag hai. Right? Um, and, and so on and so forth. What's the cuisine going to be? Who's the caterers? And the wedding dress is another big issue. That's a huge one. For one day, you're spending, I don't know how many thousand, right? It can't be any less than that because it just looks, it's a huge waste, a huge waste. But I'm not going to bash the whole, you know, wedding day ceremony problem. That's not the point of the discussion today. It's a bit beyond that. I need this suit for the walima and I need this one for the wedding day and then the honeymoon. Nobody's preparing for after marriage. The real preparation, nobody's preparing for. Entire focus the entire income, uh, expenses, is all about those days. In fact, some people think that it's the day, you know the Jews in uh, Hackney, we have a Jewish area, a very concentrated uh, Orthodox Jewish area. They're very, on the streets, they're very well behaved. They walk, you know, they, they don't mess around generally. But there's one day of the year, they, you see them on the back of trucks, music's b blaring, drunk, and they're just doing some crazy stuff. That's a, there's a specific, uh, what do you call it, uh, festival they have called Purim. And they say that it's historical where they were escaped from somewhere or whatever. But the point is that they say that's the day that God looks the other way. So you can do what you want. So this is essentially the way some of us treat our wedding day that it's one day of his life. Let him do it. Let the music come. Let the belly dancers come in the mendi. Right? It's one day. It's not going to happen again. And do you realize that that one day is probably the most critical day of your life? It's a make it or break it, right? For me, the way I've understood marriage, so when I got married, I tried to do everything when it's related to marriage according to the sunnah. Because you got two people coming together, inshallah, for the rest of their life, producing progeny until the day of judgment. Marriage is a huge idea. It's not just about me coming together with someone. Right, and then fulfilling your desires and living together because that's what everybody tells you to do or that's what everybody does. It's a big idea. Marriage is a huge undertaking. And you want everything for those two people to come together and to be able to work together, to be able to live together and provide the right environment for healthy children. You need everything that you can get about barakah. And that's why the dua that you give to a married person as soon as they get married, what do you say? Barakallahu lak. Twice you give them dua for barakah. You, you, you basically pray that they are blessed because you need blessing. A marriage is nothing without blessing. The whole secret of the success of marriage is the barakah and the blessing. How are you going to attract barakah if you do it wrongly? Right? So now you get married. Then the grind of marriage, the true grind of marriage sets in. Hardly anybody's prepared. And now I'm going to start talking about how to prepare. Before I talk about that, let me just discuss one hadith quickly. Hadith of the Prophet wasallam, which says that uh, to men, that women are generally married for four reasons. 
right? This is just the normal statistic. Women could be married for many, many reasons. People would have many, many reasons, but generally for four reasons. Likewise, women will have so many reasons for marrying men, and some of these will be relevant to women as well. Why did the Prophet talk about women here? Because he's talking to men. So he's talking in relationship to women. Had he been talking to women, he would have probably talked about men. But these particular things, they're not specific and exclusive to men only. So he said, women are either married for their wealth, their family lineage, um, their uh, beauty, or their deen. He says, make sure that you're successful and you're a champion with the deen one. Nowhere in this hadith is Aini, Asqalani, and many of the other scholars, when they've commented on this, they don't say that you must exclude the others necessarily. It's just that none of them should be priority at the expense of the deen. Now, this is something we have to understand. Let's take family lineage. If you're getting married to somebody from a great family because you just want to bragging rights, then that may be short-lived because that's going to be a very superficial reason to get married to somebody for. People look at people for independent, individual competence today, right? The family systems of the past aren't very, very, aren't very relevant today as they were before. However, if you're getting married, if you're choosing a particular family for some qualities in there, then that's wonderful. I'll give you an example. This is what the ulama have written. For example, even among the tribes of the Arabs, they were, each tribe was known for certain qualities. When I first became Imam in London, there was a Maulana there, he's passed away now. He sat me down and he explained to me all the major main families of the area. And he gave me a breakdown of each one just so that I'm aware of how to deal with them. So families are known for certain things. Some families are known to be stingy. Some families are known to be very generous. Some families are known to just be very, uh, uh, very calm in their dealings. Right? Some, like for example, one of the conditions of my fa uh, for, for us from my father was we're not getting any, uh, married to any mischievous family in a sense that something small goes wrong, they come with baseball bats to resolve it. Fair game, right? That's a fair, fair, fair condition to put, right? So different families are known for different things. So if you, do get, if you do find a family that's mashallah got ulama in them, got piety in them, righteousness in them, and other good qualities, just akhlaqi qualities. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's positive. Don't, we believe in genetics. I mean, genetics is not something you deny. So wouldn't you want from your spouse the good qualities, their good genes to also transfer so that your child has your good genes, inshallah, and their good genes? Nothing wrong with that. As long as you do it for the right reason. Number two, the, the, um, the family need the wealth. Now again, the wealth one is a double-edged sword. One thing is if you're primary doing it for the wealth, tomorrow ups and downs in the markets, and they lose all of their money, you're left with nothing, then you, you know, you're going to suffer. Wealth is not something that is permanent in that sense. But on the other hand, if that comes along with it as part of the package, with the deen and everything, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having a father-in-law that is going to assist you to buy a house, give you good gifts. Nothing wrong with that. Not that you need to be looking for that. Right? It's almost like a gamble to get the best of all four. Right? It's almost like a gamble. You just can't do that. That's up to Allah. There's nothing wrong. I mean, because the ulama have written, there's nothing wrong with the fact that when you die or your wife dies, your spouse dies, why... Why is it a problem that your children will inherit? Nothing wrong with that if they come from a wealthy family. So there's nothing wrong with it per se. It's only if you do it for the wrong reason. Now, let's take the beauty one. Now, the beauty one, we have to actually explain through a bit of science of why it's a big issue and why people get so, so messed up in this regard. You find somebody that you're attracted to, right? Of course, you should find somebody you're attracted to. If it's all about the beauty though, then you're in for a big surprise because you have to remember once you get married as you've got a stunning michelin starred wife or husband you know if you're talking because women are listening i'm assuming right yeah yeah so a michelin starred husband or spouse let's just talk about wife for now you got the most beautiful wife stunning just turns heads and so on and you get married 
What are you going to do now? Is marriage all about taking her, putting her on, the, on a pedestal and just watching her all day? Is that what marriage is? She's beauty, you start appreciating it. Okay, I'm just going to watch you all day. She's probably going to get sick of you. Right? You have to understand this. The other thing is this. So many people get married against other people's better advice, right? Generally. Because, scientifically speaking, when something excites you, there's a dopamine rush. They've reduced it down to the chemicals, the hormone that your brain releases when you get excited about something. There's a number of things, adrenaline and uh, especially dopamine when you get a satisfaction for something. So before marriage, there's, a, there's, there's no commitment. It's taboo. So you get a dopamine rush every time you see her, right? Which gets you excited, so you think, this is the right person. She's getting me excited. You're not thinking about anything else. You're not thinking long term. You're not preparing. You're only looking at the immediate rush. Then you get married, and now she's yours. And now you've got responsibilities. And there's no longer any dopamine. All the excitement's gone. And you haven't figured out all the other aspects. Whether you're compatible for other reasons. You've been very superficial in your assessment. And then you suffer. Even though you've got somebody very attractive. That's why you can never make judgments on just one or two points. Marriage is much more than that. The last thing, which is the deen. What exactly does deen in this context mean? A lot of people think it means he's praying or she's covering and praying. That means is good. That means I've got somebody with the deen. That is not enough. The deen is a lot more comprehensive than just prayer, salat and covering. In fact, if you look at deen in the context of marriage and look at the hadith, that discuss the deen in terms of and the sunnas, it's all about good character. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm the best of you in character, I'm the best of you with my wives. Generally he said, I'm the best, it's character is huge, is, is the most important factor of the deen when it comes to a marriage, because marriage is all about interaction. It's about give and take. It's about negotiation. It's about compromise. So that when you say you have to be, you have to be uh, a champion with the deen, it's huge aspect of it is akhlaq. Not at the exclusion of salat and everything. Everything is important, but the akhlaq is one of the most important factors in reference to marriage. Okay, so now that's done. Now let's talk about preparation for marriage. So how should we be preparing for marriage then? Beyond the day, beyond the, 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 the day and maybe the honeymoon. Right? Because what happens is that when you get married and if you've not done any garbar before, because if you've done the garbar before, you've already had your dopamine rushes. Then when you get married, it's just like, oh, right? we're together finally. Right? And then you generally, you, this is one of the reasons why in Islam we don't have dating. You want to invest in your marriage. You don't want to have to do it all beforehand. It needs to be done in the marriage in a halal way. That's when you get the barakah. So generally what happens, I mean, for those who have been married, they know that you have a honeymoon period, whether you go out on a honeymoon or not. You have a honeymoon period where the other person can do no wrong. You're floating around like a butterfly, right? You are basically just mesmerized. Now, how long does that last? Hmm? It depends, exactly. For some people, sorry? Are you serious? For some people, it's been like one, one hour. Right? Um, for some people, it's two weeks. For some people, it's two months. For one person I know, it was about seven months. Not that seven is a magic number, but it was seven months. And then his wife spoke back at him one day. I think she had a PMT problem, premenstrual tension, which women go through, right? Uh, for two, or two days or so before they're going to come on. And his whole world crumbled. Seriously, his whole world crumbled. He's like, what happened now? She hates my guts. Shaitan then creates. The next day he went to class. He was still studying. He went to class and he talked to his friends who were married. He's like, what's wrong with you, man? This happens all the time. Like, it's not a big deal. She'll be over it. And yes, a day later, he's like, well, how did that happen? You have to remember for men, you guys will not understand women. And women will not understand men. 
uh, un unless you get experience. And when you understand that, that women go through hormonal issues, they go through hormonal issues sometimes, not every woman, but women go through that differently. Uh, number one, um, during the PMT, which is premenstrual tension, postpartum is a huge one. And then of course there's the whole midlife crisis and then beyond that, um, would you call that at 50? Menopause, that's another one, right? And in between, if you're taking pills, one of the worst things that women can do is take pills. Be, go on the pill, right? I know the women listening and I want to mention this because this is what you have to remember is that there's a, a non-Muslim woman she's done the research on the pill. What the pill does is that a woman's body produces estrogen or estrogen. The man's body produces what? Testosterone. So for the first half of the month, the woman's body produces estrogen. And that is what helps to release the egg. Right? So the way the pill works is that it's got a part, uh, it's got a part, uh, what's the man's one again? Testosterone, and it's got a mixture of these things which suppresses the estrogen. So that means a woman who's on the pill will hardly have any estrogen. So then an egg can't be right, released. That's how they don't get pregnant. Imagine a woman who's unnaturally, her body is not producing estrogen, which is the feminine hormone. They've done research that women with estrogen will look for men that are masculine. Generally, a woman who's got estrogen, normal cycle, they will normally be inclined and attracted to men who look like men, meaning masculine, like a lion, you know, male lion, right? Um, whereas women who don't have that, they don't, that's not a big factor anymore. You can see through the, uh, I'm not, this is not a conspiracy theory, but you can see how, now when you get off East, when you get off the pill, it could take up to a year or two to get your system back on track. There's a huge change taking place in the woman's body when this happens. That's why if you do need to use something, use something else. Go and do the research. There's a new study that's just been produced about that. We're, saying that we're not saying it's, she, the, the woman who wrote it is not saying that I'm against the pill. I just want people to be educated about it to make the right decision. The pill is one of the miracle, miracle medicines of this century. It's allowed women to basically do a lot of things, both haram and halal, right? And says, we just want people to be aware of what they're doing to their body. You are basically changing your body unnaturally. Anyway, that's a separate point. Men need to understand that. So how do you prepare for marriage then? So this is what I want us to understand. This is now preparation for marriage. And those who are married, when you hear this, you'll, be, you'll, you'll, you'll resonate with this. Right? You will completely understand what I'm saying, inshallah. And if you're old enough that you've got children, you can talk to them about this. That's why I think it's relevant to everybody. Let's just take first example. This is not in any particular order, but the way to prepare for marriage is actually how am I going to live and am I competent to live? Do I have any bad qualities that are going to jeopardize my marriage? That's what we have to honestly look into. So the first thing we can say is let's look into anger problems. Do I have an anger problem? And we have to be honest with ourselves. So the way to find out is this. Just compare ourselves with our brothers and sisters, our siblings, our cousins, or those we interact with normally. Do I get more angry than them on small things and then lash out? If you do have that problem, then you're going to have a problem in marriage. Those who are married and who have anger problems will know this. It's going to have a problem because if you're constantly on small, small things getting angry, it's going to cause a problem. Now, according to our Islamic scholars, there are four personality types with regards anger, right? One is somebody who gets angry very quickly, very frequently, but calms down very quickly and frequently, very quickly, right? So one moment is red in the face, and the next, morning, the, the next moment they're smiling. The second personality type is the one who gets angry very seldomly, maybe once a year or twice a year, and then when they get angry though, they stay angry for a very long time. 
Number three is a combination of the two, a hybrid. Gets angry very quickly, very frequently, and calms down very late. So that guy is probably going to have a permanent scowl on their face, red maybe, and just always angry. In fact, before they calm down from one thing that they got angry, something else will get them angry. And before they calm down from this like compound anger, there's always going to be angry. And the fourth one is the one who hardly ever gets angry. And when they do get angry, they calm down very quickly. So which one are we? Now it's easy to look at somebody else, but which one are we? Which of these categories are we? Okay, which one is the best category here? The fourth one. Do we agree with that? Okay, actually, which is the worst category? The third one. Why do you guys buy your water for? Your Blackburn water is decent water. You don't have to pay for your water, man. This is a gimmick. In London, I can't drink the London water, but Blackburn water is okay. Um, so, the third one was the worst one. Do we all agree with that? Right? I guess so, because the guy's always going to be angry. The guy's going to suffer in life. Right? And you said the fourth one was the best one. Not necessarily. Because you need a bit of oomph in you. You need a bit of anger. Because if you have no anger whatsoever, that capacity, then that means you're going to be a coward. You could be abused. Your religion could be abused. Your Prophet ﷺ is abused. And you, don't, you just laugh at it. Because you've got, no, you got, you got no faculty of anger within you, which is to some level positive. Anyway, if we do have an anger problem, be honest about it and get help. Whether you are before marriage or whether you are already married, believe me, it will, enhance your, it will enhance your life. Not just your marriage, but your work and everything else. How do you help yourself? Hakeemul Ummat Mawna Shabitani Rahmatullahi Ali. He did a lecture, a bayan, a huge bayan on, on anger. And he said, the reason is that I felt that within me. So that's why I did the research and I gave the lecture. Believe me, I've benefited hugely because I think I get more angry than some of my brothers. Right? So when you read the works of Hakim al-Marashari Thanwi, Mawlana Masyullah Khan Sab, and earlier like uh, Imam Ghazali uh, and Imam Sha'rani, etc. You will see the way they talk about the Quranic verses, about controlling your anger, about the hadith on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi actually giving practical guidance of controlling your anger. If you're standing up, sit down. If you're sitting down, lie down. Once Abu Dhar radiallahu anh, was in like a field or something and he sat down and then he lay down in the, in the soil. And said, what are you doing? He said, this is what the Prophet Sallallahu told me because I got angry. So you basically ground yourself, so you calm yourself down. And there's psychological studies that show that if you're standing up, you're more likely to lash out than if you're sitting down. And if you notice this, if you're holding a knife, there's a prohibition of holding a knife and brandishing at somebody because the Prophet ﷺ said, maybe the shaitan will pull your hands. I don't know if you've ever held a knife, I'm not saying you should do this, but if you've ever held a knife or held a gun, there's this weird shaitani thought you have of using it. Right? And they've done the studies, they say that if you want to criticize somebody, let's just say that as an imam, if I want to crit criticize somebody for something, and I grab them after namaz, I said, I just want to talk to you, and we stand up, and I, that is the worst thing you can do. They say that when you, if you, the best way to make somebody receptive to criticism is to sit them down. Actually, the best way is to make them lie down. So call them to your house, give them a dawat, and lay out the takiyas, you know, the, the pillows, give them an ink, uh, and then start, and then start. And you'll be able to get it. Like, especially if you've got like a business partner or something like that. Never do it standing up because people are just too, just too ready to go. That's why in America, if you, I don't know about here, I haven't been stopped by police much here, but in America, I read their studies. When the police stop you in a car, you're not supposed to get out of the car. Number one, in America, you're not because it's dangerous. In fact, if you get out of the car, they can shoot you because it's illegal to get out. You're supposed to sit there. Then what they do is you roll down your window and they come. And instead of standing in front of you, at the front of the car, to talk to you, they actually stand behind you and they speak to you from behind you. Like from the side of the window. Why is that? The studies show that if you're in front to front, you're more likely to lash out and then make a mistake. So anger is a major issue. There are ways to curb it. And if you've got a serious anger problem, then there's also anger management courses. You can take them online. You have to be honest about it. It's like, have you got a mental health problem? You need to be honest and get help. Otherwise, it's going to spoil your marriage and a lot of other a part of your life. That was about anger. Let's move on to something else. 
Are you a person who is extremely emotional and sensitive and cry easily and then give the silent treatment? Anything small happens, you, get, you start tearing, crying and you get emotional. Now remember, in some of these things, women will be struggling more with them and some of the men will be struggling more with them. So it's across the board. Are you an emotional person like that? Every small thing. For example, I know a person and his wife. I knew them from before marriage. When they got married, the husband's family, the husband didn't have a father, only a mother. He's got two sisters that are disabled and one brother who's disabled. The wife to be got married, decided to get married even though she knew that because she said, I don't mind, I'll do the khidmah. So you can see she's coming with a righteous attitude. They got married. Now what happens is the mother-in-law, her mother-in-law, his mother, her problem is that on small, small things, she starts giving the silent treatment. Now if you've ever lived with somebody and they stop talking to every week or, you know, it's difficult. So Alhamdulillah, the husband, he got another house close by and now Alhamdulillah, it's all fine. You know, they've sorted out. Those people who have this problem, you have a gift of Allah. A gift of Allah. It's causing you problems. You've got a gift of Allah. How is it a gift of Allah if it's causing you problems? And the way it's a gift of Allah is that there are so many people out there whose hearts are so hard that even on the 27th night they cannot weep a tear in their dua to Allah. And you are doing it for free. Like you cry for nothing. You are wasting your tears. That's why the mashaykh, they say, I, I spoke to one a great person about this because somebody was always tearing. He said, use that whenever you feel teary, do two things. Either open the Quran with a tarjuma translation and reflect over the Quranic surahs or stories or whatever. You'll have enough to cry about. Don't waste your tears. Cry there. Or number two, put your hands up to Allah and cry to Allah and He will answer you rather than waste your tears. You have huge value, mashallah. I give you an example now about how to prepare your children for marriage. One day, one of my children, I think it was probably about when he was eight or nine years old, he came home from school and in the discussion he said, I'm not speaking, you know, there's a friend of his or somebody in his class, I'm not speaking to him. I'm not speaking to him right now. I said, what are you doing? How can you, what kind of an idea is it? Where did you learn this from? We don't do this. This is such a lazy attitude to just small, small things, you stop speaking to people, deal with it, get, get, you know, have the discussion and get it over with. Yes, there are valid places and valid reasons as we know from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to stop talking to somebody, but not on petty small issues. That's a lazy attitude. Alhamdulillah, since then, do you do that? Alhamdulillah, right? So, Alhamdulillah, since then, he's never done that. Where did he learn it from? We don't do that, right? Where did he learn it from? Probably somebody else in his class who said, you know, I'm not speaking to you. So that's how children learn these things. And it's a bad idea. Like deal with the matter. In fact, what we say to the children is if you've got somebody who's troubling you in class, rather than praying against him. Because remember this kid, you're going to have to live with them for the next or spend time with them for the next four or five years until you graduate from that school. And if you don't like them and you pray against them, it's just going to be more problems. So why don't you make dua for them that Allah sought them out? So it's better for everybody. It's better for you. It's better for everybody. I think this is the way that we have to explain to our children. So if you have an emotional problem, you need to deal with it. You need to use it in the right way. Now these two are easy, right? These two you can know. I mean, anybody will know that. You can't hide these things. If you're an angry person, you'll know that. And if you're an emotional person, you'll know that. Now the next one is a bit more tricky. So you said you're 12 years old. Did you understand these two so far? Yeah. I'm not picking on you, it's just, uh, mashallah, you're sitting in front of me and I, uh, when I've got a talk and I've got young, sometimes we ignore them, but I try to include them because they are sitting there and t t to be useful for you. Now see if you can understand this one. Third problem. Are you a narcissistic, arrogant, domineering, always right individual? Now, did you understand that? So essentially what this means is that you are always right and everybody must do according to you. When you go in, it must be your way or no other way. Do you understand? It must be your way. You are just arrogant. You're always right. You are better than everybody else and everybody has a problem. 
That's what you call kibr, ujub, all the whole package put together. Right? Narcissism, arrogance, conceit, and whatever else you want. You understand me that now? You're not like that, right? Now that's a difficult one. You can't even self-diagnose this because we justify. A person with arrogance will always justify to themselves that no, I'm right. This is the way it is. They're all stupid. That's why I do this. You know, one of the wonderful hadith about the Prophet ﷺ, there are some people who actually think from a deeny perspective as well, like they've learned a bit of deen, and they think everybody else is messed up. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and this is what helps me get over this, he said, if you think the people are halik, then you are ahlakuhum, you are the most destroyed of them because of your perspective. How can you say everybody's messed up? So that you don't talk to anybody, you're la ya'lif wa la There's no good in there's no good in and virtue in the person who is not dealt with uh, conducively by others and who does not deal with others in a in a good friendly way. Like he's got problems with everybody. We get calls from women and men sometimes that my husband is like this. So we say then why don't you talk to him? He says, I can't talk to him. He said, tell his dad to talk to him. He doesn't listen to him. Tell the Maulana, the, the Imam of the Masjid. No, he doesn't listen to anybody. He said, I, I can't help now. You need magic from Allah. You know, you need something straight. You need a special, mashallah, a special miracle to happen to you because that guy is, mashallah. So this is the problem. As I said, the first two are easy to diagnose. The third one is a very difficult one to diagnose. You have to be honest with yourself because you have to contribute to this marriage. Now there's two things I want to mention here quickly before I mention some other things. Just to give you an idea and then you can do this yourself to be honest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in every one of us certain qualities and certain challenging qualities. Certain positive qualities and certain negative qualities. For example, if I compare myself to my brothers, then some of us are more intellectual than the others. Right, smarter in brain, right? Some of us are more generous than others. Some of us are tighter than others. And some of us are more angry, get more angry quickly than others. It's just natural, natural. You can compare yourself to your own brothers and sisters, you'll understand this. Now, we're not sinful for that. That's, that's fitra, that's our fitra. Like for example, I found myself to be more stingier than one of my brothers. That's my nature, I'm not sinful for that yet. Do you understand? I might find myself to be getting more angry at small, small things than my brother. I'm not sinful yet, but now let's just take the miserliness issue, the tightness, right? Does anybody feel like that here? Who's a bit tight, who feel that they're a bit, they don't find it easy to spend? Is there anybody like that? Doesn't look like it. Nobody? I mean, I am anyway, I'm going to put my hand up, right? No? Okay, so at least one honest person. Right? And you? Okay, alhamdulillah. Yeah. See, I like the bayans to be a bit interactive, otherwise people sleep. And I'm not doing justice. Once I went to a bayan in South Africa. I gave you a bayan. Believe me, the brothers in the front, they're all sitting there reading tasbis. So I asked them a question. They're looking at my face. I was like, Ye kya hora? Like, what are you sitting here? Tabarrukan or what? Speak. Right? Make it educational. So, what was I speaking about? So, let's take stinginess. Now, if I, if I find it difficult to spend, when others can easily spend, right? That is a challenge for me. But I'm not sinful for that yet. I'm only sinful if I... It's only sinful to be miserly in three cases. Where, it's, where you withhold when it's fard or obligatory for you to spend. Or where it's mustahab and recommended to spend. Shariatan, shar'an. And number three, where it's socially considered to be good to spend and you don't spend. So the first one where it's wajib and necessary to spend and you don't spend, what is that? Zakat and Sadaqatul Fitr and so on, where it's recommended to spend is like fundraisers. Uh, uh, th there's a fundraiser going on for Syria or for Rohingya or whatever. Everybody's crying, everybody's taking out money, but you find you got money, but you can't even take 10 pounds out. That's pound honey, obviously. Why? Because I don't know. You, know. you just can't. It's difficult. What about socially, culturally? This goes against muru'a. Chivalry, common decency. So for example, 
I don't give it to anybody because it's a bidat. It's not in the sunnat. Koi hadith hai uski idi dene ki. There's nothing wrong with it as long as you don't think it's given obligation. Right? Children feel good about it. Alhamdulillah. There's nothing wrong with that if you don't do it for the wrong reason. But I'm like, it's bidah. But when it, I take it. Right? People are send food to my house, but I don't send it to their house. It's not a sunnah. Well, actually, it is a sunnah to send food to others, your neighbors. Another one. You go to a restaurant to eat. Which, which restaurant do you guys go to eat? What's like the latest one here? Because you guys keep changing every few months. What is it Bukhara or what is it now? Huh? It became like this Kobida thing I kept hearing about. Huh? Chicken, whatever, al or whatever it is that you go to. So you all go to eat, right? With your friends. And it comes time to pay. Well, you finish now. So you go to wash your hands. Is that, why are you guys laughing? What's wrong with going to wash your hands? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Do you do that or something? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. This is just self-diagnosis. Again, you're not sinful for how Allah has made you, but if you do not control the anger, for example, you don't control them, open up the miserliness, then you will be sinful because it will lead to a sin. These are our challenges. So that was three points of how to prepare for marriage and likewise how to enhance our marriage. Believe me, there are people who've been in marriages for 30 years and have never thought about this. They know they've got a problem, but they're not willing to make a change. In fact, they think this is how it's going to be now forever. And I'm here to tell you that believe me, you can make a change. Because akhlaq, this is all about akhlaq. Akhlaq can be corrected. The Prophet ﷺ would never have told us to correct akhlaq if it wasn't for that fact. Now, let me tell you a few other things just so you get an idea of how to think about this. There are so many factors. Let's take the fourth one. What was the fourth one? Miseriness. Are you a miserly person? If you are a miserly person, you're going to struggle in your marriage. There's only one place where the Prophet ﷺ has allowed the wife to steal from the husband. Not steal, but take without permission. Right? There's a different, you know, psycholinguistics. If I say he lied, Ibrahim ﷺ lied, that's bad. If I say Ibrahim ﷺ said something that was not in accordance to the reality, can you suddenly see how it becomes a bit more positive? You know, when he had to say, she's my sister to about his wife. He said something that was against the reality for a good reason. In fact, it was even correct because in Islam, she is her. And in humanity, she is a sister anyway, right? So it's about the words we use as well. So let's just say that you get married. Uh, Abu Sufyan, radiallahu an, was uh, his wife, Hinda. She was actually uh, allowed to take from him. Because you can't have stinginess for at least for the basic needs. So are you going to be somebody who gives your wife a certain amount of money that she not to spend on herself, but to spend for the family and then you want an itemized bill at the end of the month, like as though she works for Vodafone or something like that, right? You give her a spreadsheet. I know some wives do need something like that, to be honest, because they think the money grows from the trees from the husband. They just, they just take it out wherever they can. My silliness. Another one. Can you see what I'm, th what I'm saying now? What's another one? Let's take another one. Are you so much into your football fanatically because it's your second religion or maybe even your first religion, right? And I'm serious. The psychologic, again, if you really look into supporting teams, the psychology, they've studied the psychology and they found the same kind of psychological fascination or fanaticism that they find in religious people as they do in football supporters. Imagine somebody in London who supports Manchester City or Manchester United for that matter. They've never been there, they've, they, they, they've never met the players, they don't know anything, they've supported for 20 years. Why? What makes you support that team when you don't even know they've been through so many changes? Like, just think about it. Cello, I think if you support your local team, I can see some logical justification. But why would you support a team that you got no, nothing to do with? What is it in chemically in your mind that's making you do that? Or is it shaitan or what is it? So they've actually done studies and they found the same kind of religious, you know, what religious people have about their adherence to their deen. They found that same thing for that. Imagine if you didn't do that, how much more you'd have for your deen. So I'm talking about this scientifically. And you can research this more if you want to. If you're really into that, you're going to come home from work and then you must spend two hours on the watching football or YouTube is a bigger one. What are you going to do with your family? 
Or let's take another one. Are you so much into your family that every moment you're going to get, you're going to go back to your family's house? This is generally with the girls that happens. Every moment they go to, so then their new house, get, they don't invest enough in there. And that, that suffers because they're always at their mother's house. Are you one who is so close to their friends that you're going to give them a running commentary of your marital journey? One couple, they got married and they, you know, you have this little bit of issues, right? The real, you know. So she used to give a WhatsApp commentary to her friends. Like that's, in, you know, there's enough episodes that you have on Netflix and so on. You don't need another one going on. It's crazy. In fact, there's one woman, uh, one mother, she used to always give her daughter advice of how to deal with her husband. Then one day she told the daughter that, you know what, from tomorrow or from today, I don't want you to tell me, ask me about how to deal with your husband. I want you to deal with him because I don't know your husband the way you do. You know, we, the, the, the wife will always know the husband more than the mother. The mother knows her husband, but through the reflection of her own experience. So it's totally different, different people. The daughter found it very bad. She felt that she was being abandoned. But she says that was the biggest gift that her mother gave her. Because now she was able to deal with it herself. And it became better. Stop remote controlling. Or stop allowing your marriage to be remote, remote controlled by somebody else. These are the problems you will have. If you're too much into your friends, you're too much into your sports, you're too much into this, how are you going to invest in your in your marriage. So, what you have to understand about culture is that there's the good and bad culture. The bad culture has to be taken out. Like the culture says that you must have this function and that function or whatever. That must be eradicated if it's debilitating and harmful. But you cannot divorce. There are people who come and say, I want to get married and do everything without culture. In fact, there's somebody who came and he says, I don't want to even marry a born Muslim. I want to marry a convert. I said, why? He said, because they don't come with baggage. I said, they come with a different baggage. Everybody comes with baggage. Human beings, everyone has a certain baggage. Now let's take culture, right? So the ulama here as well. How do you spend Eid day according to the sunnah? How would you do Eid al-Fitr according to the sunnah? You've just finished Ramadan. Eid ki chan ki khabarage, right? There's no taraweeh that night. Now let's see all the sunnahs that you would do. Everything according to Sharia, what would you do? So one is you also do some ibadat on that night, right? We have the fadila of doing some ibadat on Eid night. Number two, you wake up in the morning and uh, you, wear, you eat something sweet because it's Eid al-Fitr. Uh, you wear the best clothing you have. You wear perfume and all the Eid sunnahs. You go to the namaz. You uh, make dua because that's your yawmul ja'iza. And then you finish and then you come back home, right? With another way, all the Eid sunnahs. Then how do you spend the rest of the Eid day according to sunnah? Isn't that where the good culture comes into it? So one of the cultures was to visit the graveyard. Why did you visit graveyards on Eid day? It's not a sunnah to visit graveyards on Eid day, but why do people, why did people visit graveyards? Or why do they do that? Well, Allahu alam, but one of the reasons is that in places like India, the graveyard and the musalla of Eid, the Eidgah, is generally on the outskirts of the village in the same similar place. Because you don't, in villages at least, you don't do Eid namaz in the masjid, you generally do it outside, as the sunnah was. So generally, the, the Qabristan was there, so they probably just walked over the Qabristan, so it became a tradition. Wallahu alam, there may be some other reason. So how else would you do it? So if your culture, you know, you visit one another, you cook certain foods, as long as it's not done for the sake of religious Eid or whatever, then that's culture. You cannot remove all culture from your life. There's a couple who got married. He was Gujarati, she was Bangladeshi. He had been married before and divorced. And he'd seen, I don't know, tens of women before he finally said, I, I found this one who's, who didn't have culture, he thought. So they both agreed that we're not going to do anything cultural. It's just going to be whatever is religious and that's it. He used to live in front of his mother. Okay. So now Bangladeshis have a tradition that when you get married, any Bangladeshis here? You have a tradition, right? That you, when you get married, you have to go to your wife's house after a few days to so stay there for a few days. Right? 
Uh, at least in London and Bangladesh do that, right? Maybe you're deprived of that, right? Um, so, sorry? So you don't know that? Okay. So he said, I'm not going to do that. He didn't do that. But then later her sister became pregnant and she felt it was her obligation to go and be the first person to be there for her sister. And she was there for hours and hours, days and days, and that encroached on him. But then on his side, his mother lives opposite. So once a week, they go to the mother's house to eat. Now, you can't just go and eat your mother's food. You must cook something and take it. So now his wife's saying, why are you telling me to cook to take it? That's culture. It's just silly. So then they realize that you cannot have a marriage without culture because culture is part and parcel of us. So good parts of culture, there's nothing wrong with it. It's only the bad part of culture where they make you buy expensive things or do weird things or crazy things. That's where the problem is. So now to finish off, two things. Number one, for a successful marriage now, you need a love bank account. You guys have one? The married ones? You know, not Starling Bank or um, all these other ones. You need a love bank account. What a love bank account is, a lot of people, they come and ask, they say, what are the rights of marriage that I must fulfill? Or what are my rights that she must fulfill? Now, while that's relevant, and that's, but you have to remember, that's just the basic hudud and boundaries. A marriage can't function on that, only on that. It's like saying that, but I'm just going to do the fara'is of prayer. So I'm going to say Allahu Akbar, which is a shart. Um, I'm going to read uh, one large verse, which is the fard, and more than that is, is wajib, so I'm not going to do that, I'm just going to lead. I'm going to do ruku, I'm going to do sajda, like uh, with, one, uh, with the feet off the ground, because you don't need to really put the feet on the ground, and so on and so forth, and I'm going to give one salam at the end. What kind of a namaz is that? Is that your marriage? Is that the way you want to do your marriage? In your namaz, to make it nice, you need the wajibat, you need the sunnas, you need the adab, you need everything to make it nice. So you need that in your marriage. You have to go beyond so, everything you're going to do extra for your spouse, that's going to deposit a balance into your love bank. What that means is that you're going to inevitably have problems. Is there anybody here who's never had a, even a minor problem in their marriage? We've been looking for that person for a very long time. Is there anybody who's married, never had even a small issue? Even the Prophet ﷺ had a problem in their marriage. On one occasion, he went away and stayed in a loft. Umar radiallahu anhu's daughter was married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He actually got worried. Has the Prophet sallallahu divorced his wives? It was about some expense issues or something, right? One day, the Prophet sallallahu went to Fatima radiallahu anhu's looking for Ali radiallahu anhu, his son-in-law, one of the best couples in the world, right? Where is Ali? Oh, we had a bit of an issue. He's in the masjid. So he came to the masjid, and there, the, Ali, that's when he called him Abu Turab, Kum Aba Turab. There are going to be issues in a marriage. What you have to learn is to deal with those issues. So the love bank means that you go over and above. So for example, if you've come home, help her set up the food. Help her tidy up. Help her wash the dishes. Help her with the children. If you generally don't do so because you don't have time, but today you've got the time, what that does, all of these extra things, or she will do things extra for you, that will create a balance. So now when you do have a little issue, you see, when you have a little issue, shaitan rides that problem and makes it worse. So he makes it seem like she hates your guts now. So you respond with animosity as well, and then it just gets bad. Let's just say she's got a bit of a hormonal issue, so she was a bit sensitive, so she said something. You said something back. Then she says something back. And then after that, that's why you're not allowed to stay apart for more than three days. Because after three days, you become solid. It becomes permanent. But with the husband and wife, you shouldn't even be overnight. It should be very less than that. So anyway, if you have a love bank, you're, you're gonna, if something does wrong, does happen, you say, no, but you know, yesterday she did all of that for me. She bought me that gift. He bought me flowers. Now, when I say flowers, right, women like to be uh, praised in a different way to men. As men, you may love your wife and you do everything out of that love. But if you don't tell her that you love her, then she's not going to appreciate it. And if you tell her, then mashallah, you're going to get a lot for that. It makes a huge difference because they just function differently and men don't get it sometimes. So now, if you are going to go and buy flowers once a week, same old flowers, once a week on Friday you give it, it's going to get boring. 
Because a gift is the, one of the best parts of a gift is the element of surprise. Yes, if every week you're going to find the nicest flowers, different flowers every week, show, you show your concern and your care, yeah, that's going to make a difference. You can't do a lot one day and then not the other day. It has to be constant and in small amounts. For example, you're not a dentist, are you? Um, what are you? In school? What are you used to do? So let's just say that you decide that, you know, every day in the morning I don't get enough time to brush my teeth because I'm busy. So on Sunday, tomorrow, I'm going to brush it for one hour. So I don't have to do it for the rest of the week. What do you think to that, man? Just brush your teeth, okay, half an hour, then you have to brush it for the rest of the week. They're going to tell you that's actually harmful, right? It's better to brush for two minutes every day than to brush for that. So that's why whatever you do for each other for the sake of Allah, it's a sadaqah what you spend on your family anyway. So you do that constantly, small, small, that creates a balance. So whenever small issues do arise, they will say, it will take some of that balance away. If you've got no balance and something wrong happens, you've depleted your balance. Most marriages that are having problems because they've got no love balance, they're at each other all the time. And the way to change is to think about these things, about how you prepare for marriage. You can translate that into how to enhance your marriage. So finally, the last point I want to make, before I, if, uh, then I'll say, we'll make a dua and then whoever wants to leave, they can leave. But we did, I think, did we promise questions? Right, so we'll take questions for whoever needs questions because generally that's the most important. Marriage issues are so unique that it's good to take questions. The last thing I want to mention is that when you get married, what are you doing? I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way. What are you doing when you get married? Are you just fulfilling a sunnah? Yes, you are. But what is this sunnah you're fulfilling? Is it just to fulfill your desires? Is it because everybody does it, your brothers and everybody has done it, why are you getting married for? So all of those things would be relevant, but the biggest issue when you get married is that do you understand the significance that you are actually starting a whole new line, maybe until the Day of Judgment? All of those people that will come from your children and grandchildren will come back to you as the great-great-grandparents. And what you do is going to affect that. Because in Islam, we believe that all the good things the parents do, there are barakat of it that descend into the progeny. That's why whenever the dua is made for children, it's never for your immediate children only. It's always for dhurriya. One of the magical duas in the Quran, you should write this down, is the Quran in surah, in, is the dua in Surah Al-Furqan, verse 74. Uh, and please read it with me once, at least we've done it. Rabbana, atina, sorry, Rabbana, hablana, min azwajina, وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا The scholars say that this is such a magical dua. What it means is, O oh, oh, our Lord, grant us from our spouses, husband or wife or husband, uh, wives, and our progeny until the Day of Judgment. ذُرِّيَّا Not just immediate children. Those that will be the gladness of our eyes. Not just, I believe, not just in this world, but inshallah in the hereafter as well and make us the leaders of the righteous ones. Ulama write that if you read this dua frequent enough and it gets accepted insha'Allah, the problems you have with your spouse, the things which irritate you, that bother you about your spouse, either Allah will eliminate them and get rid of them. Or if it's not, doesn't get el uh, eliminated, then they, he will make them so insignificant in your eyes that they won't bother you anymore. And I'm not joking, it's one of the best duas you could read for a good marriage. Because you are doing this for your children. You know, a lot of the problems outside with children, sorry, with even adults who are causing problems in the society is rage. They've had an unbalanced upbringing. Maybe the father was absent. Maybe the mother was a drug addict. Maybe the father and mother were constantly at each other's. They've taught them rage because every time they saw their father, he was in rage. The mother was angry. The mother was emotional. And that's going to get to the children. The studies show that, you're, you're, the, the, if, in fact, they sh it shows that if a father is absent the, and a girl, the daughter, she's actually going to start her menstruation earlier. Do, uh, where there's fathers who are absent, it actually shows that girls are most likely to be, uh, what do you call it, get abused. Because they're looking for, they're looking for a fatherly figure. And there's lots of weird abusers outside willing to give them that false love and that's why they groom them and so on. It has an effect. One of my friends who's very prominent and very wealthy in another country, 
he's starting a waqf, an endowment, because he's got a lot of money to, for the deen. And he has written a wasiyah for all of his children and grandchildren who will work in that, of how they must behave and so on. Not just that. Look how far he's thinking. He's also, he's also written a wird kitab, a book of du'as, certain athkar, that anybody who works for this waqf and benefits from it will have to read this du'a collection or this athkar collection, this wird, every week or every day or whatever. Because he wants to do the right thing. We don't even think about what's going to happen to our grandchildren. That's why we need to sort our situation out. It doesn't matter if we've had 40 years of problems in our marriage. That's my only message here, really. That we improve our marriages so we can have better children who grow up and be better, better human beings and lessen the problems that we have out there. You know, people with major psychological problems because they came from messed up families. That's why it's so important. You still owe it to your progeny. That's why the Prophet ﷺ could say that I was born without any zina and without any safa from all my forefathers. Nobody committed zina. Can you see the big idea that you are starting when you get married and are going to have children? You may have never thought about it that way. It's a really big issue. So we stop here. And uh, we just make a dua and then we can, so then whoever wants to go, they can go. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak ti adhan jalali wal ikram. اللهم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث اللهم يا حنان يا منان لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين اللهم يا معذن الجود والكرم يا أرحم الراحمين يا خير المسؤولين ويا خير المؤطين يا أكرم الأكرمين يا الله we ask you for your special mercy يا الله we ask you for your special forgiveness أو الله these brothers are sitting here on this Saturday on this on this evening when they could have been doing so many other things. Oh Allah, there are people who are listening at home. Oh Allah, we ask that if you have brought us here, then it can only be because you want to give us. Oh Allah, have your special mercy upon us. Oh Allah, grant us blessing and barakah. Oh Allah, grant us complete forgiveness. We have many shortcomings, many wrongs, many sins, and many crimes to our name. Things that we remember, things that we have forgotten. Oh Allah, we especially ask you for forgiveness for, from those sins that have now become actually part of our life and we no longer even consider them sins anymore. Oh Allah, we ask that you grant us beneficial knowledge, that you grant us discernment, understanding. You give us a life of taqwa and purity. Oh Allah, that you give us respect for our deen. Oh Allah, that you give us respect for everything related to our deen. Oh Allah, that you make your obedience beloved in our hearts. Oh Allah, that you make your disobedience hated in our hearts. Oh Allah, our situation is such that if people realize who we really were inside, they would not want to look at us. They would not want to associate with us. Oh Allah, but you are more merciful than even the mother. Oh Allah, sometimes a mother sees her child who people like to pick up, but then that child becomes soiled and dirty. And now nobody wants to pick that child up. Everybody shuns that child. But oh Allah, you've given such mercy to this mother. The mother, she will pick up that child with that dirt, cleanse him, purify him, make him smell nice again. Oh Allah, we know we've been told that your mercy is greater than every mother in this, in this world. Oh Allah, that's why we are polluted. We, are, we have problems. Oh Allah, we ask you especially forgiveness from those sins that have brought darkness in our homes, that have taken the blessing out of our homes, that have turned husband and wife against one another, that have turned children against their parents and parents against children, that have caused and created acrimony among the society and community, that has caused disunity among the ummah. Oh Allah, unite us together. Oh Allah, grant us your love and the love of those whose love benefits us in your court. Oh Allah, bless all of those who've established these masajid, who work hard for these masajid, who lead the prayers, who do the durus, who manage the affairs. Oh Allah, we, uh, we, we ask that you allow us to stand up to the challenges of today. There are so many fit and outside, especially for our children. Oh Allah, do not let us see a bad day with our children. Oh Allah, there are many fit and many, many mis much mischief out there. There's many things that distract us, and especially our children. Oh Allah, we ask that you allow us to protect them. Oh Allah, that you, uh, you've given us children, you will give us children. So oh Allah, allow us to also fulfill their rights. Oh Allah, we are responsible. Oh Allah, grant us, grant us the coolness and gladness of our eyes from our spouses. And oh Allah, from our progeny until the day of judgment. So that we can rise on the day of judgment and we will be told that, look, so and so is your great-great-grandson or great-great-granddaughter. 
and all that sadaqah jariyah will be inshallah for us. Oh Allah, allow us to leave behind legacies, sadaqah jariyah, especially in the form of righteous children and progeny. Oh Allah, grant us beneficial knowledge and keep us from harmful knowledge. O oh Allah, reward all of those who facilitated this program and worked hard for it. O oh Allah, accept it from all of us and bless the entire community and the entire Muslim Ummah. And O oh Allah, protect us from all the strange things that are happening around, especially from the debilitating sicknesses and illnesses and all the other challenges that we face. O oh Allah, we ask finally that you send your abundant blessings on our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you grant us his company in the hereafter. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alam. So what we'll make it is that those of you who have to leave because you have to go to sleep or dawah or please feel free to leave. Those who've got questions, we can take a few questions inshallah. And feel free to ask any question related to marriage. If you don't want to say it, you can write it down and send it. Right? Because I, I found in marriage issues, there's the underlying issues. Uh, sometimes you can't, people don't find it easy to speak about. Yes. Louder, louder. Okay. Allahu Akbar. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The question to repeat is that we have uh, in different communities this works differently. They force you, your parents, to get you married to somebody from a very specific family or your specific culture or or your specific background. Now I want to emphasize that you know the cu culture question is very relevant here. There are huge benefits in marrying within your own culture. This will be the first alim who may tell you that, right, in a different way. I'm gonna, and you can agree or disagree, it's up to you. But there are huge benefits in marrying in your own culture. I know you've, ha you've suffered maybe with your culture, the negative aspects of your culture, you may have suffered, right? Some people have suffered with their culture, so that's why they just want nothing to do with their culture. They don't realize the greater problems in other cultures. You just don't know about them. What we do is that, we have problems in our masjid, but that masjid doesn't have a problem. But you become a local of that and you'll see the problem. Every place has issues. Okay, some places are better than others. So if you've become a self-hating culture problem, you know, person. The, okay, let's talk about the benefits of marrying your own culture. Marrying your own culture, the benefit is that you already know the cultural uh, demands. So you don't have to learn anything new. You probably don't have to learn a new language. Food-wise, you'll be similar, right? Uh, for your extended family, especially since we're still like second, third generation. There's people who still don't speak English properly, which is kind of the common language. So there's benefits in, there's definitely benefits, but of course there can be. But that shouldn't mean that you can't get married to another culture. Alhamdulillah, it's opening up more. But in some cultures, one woman called me. She's about 40 years old. And she had an issue about something and then she said she's married to a non-Muslim man. So I said, that's strange. She clearly had fikr and concern for her deen because she's asking me a question about something, but she's married to a non-Muslim. I said, what happened? She said, when I was younger, my parents forced me to marry somebody from Punjab or whatever, right? Generally, you know, there, there's this issue in certain cultures more than others, and we just couldn't get along. So then, you see, a lot of these parents, they force you to marry, and they say that is Islamic. You must listen to your parents and it's Islamic to do this. They've not taught them any other Islam. So the children grow up thinking that is Islam. And that's abusive. So they think Islam is abusive. Do you understand? Some people if they then realize no Islam is not that that was my parents problem, then it's okay but otherwise it's a problem. There's another one, she just called me, she's about, I don't know, 39 or whatever. She was forced to get married to against somebody. She didn't want to. She'd see no compatibility. Her father was suffering, sick at that time. So they blackmailed her and said that if anything happens to your father, you're going to be blamed. So she got married. And then, father died or whatever. She would go to her mother because the guy wouldn't do anything. He would just basically, he wouldn't take any responsibility of anything. 
wouldn't indulge her nothing. She went to her mother. You know her mother's advice was, have children and he'll be fine. She had one child, went back, have more children. She's got three children, nothing happened. And finally she got out of the marriage. And now, alhamdulillah, she's doing an alima class. But her question now is, am I ever going to see happiness? We have some huge problems. So parents need to be open. If the person is decent that your child wants to get married to, then you need to bite the bullet and let them do it rather than create a bigger fitna. We have hadith to that effect as well. right? That if there is somebody that comes to ask for your daughter's hand or your child's hand, who you have no problem with their faith, then let it be. The best thing to be honest, you know, a lot of parents, they suffer afterwards because they have not brought their children up to think like them. And then they wonder why their children want to marry somebody else. Really, I'm going to blame the parents. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions that if the children, anything wrong happens to them, the father, the parent have to have some blame. If your children, when they grow up, they don't want to marry according to you, it means you have not brought them up in the right way of the way you wanted. Or maybe you did bring them up the right way and they're, they're doing the right thing. You see what I'm saying? So you can't complain now, it's too late. Right? You are causing people to lose faith if you do this in the name of Islam. You have to be holistic about this. But at the same time, the best option for both the child, the, the, the young man or boy uh, or girl, and the parent is that they try to understand from it. Sit down and say, okay, you want to get married, you need to get married now. What do you think? And said, what do you think? And let's try to come up with a criteria of the kind of person we're looking for. Do this early enough. Don't wait until they find somebody and then you don't like them. Because the way the world is open now, your child is probably going to find somebody. Unless you're very lucky. So, it works both ways. In some cases, we just have to say, let it go. And in other cases, we're going to say, no, try to keep it within the culture. Yes. Salam wa rahmatullah. To tell them to get married and support them, yeah. How does a person who doesn't have extended family, how do they find a spouse? There's many, many ways. I mean, one, you should make some friends in the local community and let them see if they can find somebody within, your, uh, within their family. Talk to the local imam, see if he knows somebody. Talk to some of the local scholars or other people who work with others. And you just have to, you just have to not be embarrassed and you have to uh, basically ask people. But you have to probably get to know them. If you're just like a stranger and say, like, can you find me somebody to marry? They're, they're, they're going to run away. But you have to probably get to know somebody. Have some sabr. And you know the dua that I read? That's very good. You should keep reading that dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist in that regard as well. Because it's late, I'm just going to try to give short answers so that we can get through more if we need to. And if you've got no more questions, then we can walk away. Yes. What do I think of wives working? If we, if we didn't have wives working, there would be no alima classes. Or the Islamic schools would have a problem. So what do you mean by that? Well, it depends on the work. Right? If a woman wants to do business at home, right, online, or she wants to go in an all-female and you need it, and it's not going to neglect the children, then we can't say There's no like hard and fast rule that you just can't. But the one thing is that what, there are some hard and fast rules that so you have to remember them. The one hard and fast rule is that the man is the, is the sole provider. It's his responsibility. So he can't force his wife to go out to work. He just can't. Unless like they're just suffering or something, then maybe she has to do something. That's like a critical extreme issue, right? So number one, I had one case of a guy I know. He is very religious. He forced his, his actually his wife told me, he said that he's for, she's a niqabi, he's forcing me to go out to work because he can't find a job which is not mixed. Right? So, there's the other thing you have to remember is that career oriented where you're neglecting your children and you just want to work, right? That's quite dangerous because really, while you're allowed to work, 
but it, the environment is very important. Now, think of this scenario. You've got a woman and a man. They have a five, uh, you know, full-time job, let's just say. So they get up in the morning, and when you go to work, you have to get dressed. There's a certain dress code, and, you know, you have to uh, dress up for it. So she spends about an hour dressing up, preparing herself, and she goes. Now she's going to spend the freshest six, seven hours of her day in the company of numerous people, men and women. They're going to do projects together, right? Because that's what you do at work, you do projects together. Now, human beings, we become associated with one another through uh, interaction. So, if we're doing a project together, we're on the same team. You're going to start to learn about the other person. They're going to learn about you. You're going to start comparing that person to your spouse. And clearly, there's going to be some issues here and there. Shaitan's going always around. Now, you finish the job. Let's just say you had a success. So, high fives, or even if you don't do that, there is a bonding that takes place. Wow, we did this together. There's a bonding that takes place. If you had a failure, there's a bonding that takes place where you deal with your failure. Psychologically, you're going to become very close. You can't... If, it's very difficult to avoid that. It's precarious. It's dangerous. Right? Now you come home and you're tired. You get out of your clothes, you put in casual, you know, whatever. So you dress up every day for outside, spend the seven, eight hours of the freshest time of your day. And then you come home and you're knocked out. And you're also comparing. Do you know, and I, you know, I, I don't say this just randomly. Do you, know the, do you know what day or what date the highest number of divorces are recorded or entered, registered? 2nd of January. Because of the Christmas period and the parties. If you're at work, you're going to have Christmas parties. Call them holiday party, whatever, right? Forget the halal haram part of it. The main part of it is that that's a time when everybody, the drinks are flowing and the, the hair is loose and there is so much zina that takes place and flirting that takes place in that atmosphere. Every week in the news, you've got a different industry that's got a Me Too movement problem, right? Started with whatever, you know, the media industry to Wall Street to da-da-da-da-da. It's everywhere. It's rife. Zina is so am. And that's where you're going to be unless you have to be. So it's, a, it's not an easy question to answer in that sense because there's no like some of the Sahabia, they worked in the fields. Zubair ibn Awam's wife, which was Asma, she would help him. So in India, I'm sure they go into the fields but there's adab for that. There's boundaries for that. So you have to be careful if you, uh, uh, what you're talking about. Right? So it, it, the devil is in the detail. Let's put it that way. That's a good question. Um, Are you the only one who's going to ask questions? Having a gap between Rika and Nuqsati, I personally am not for it. In some cases, you have to do it because there's just one person, he goes, I got, a friend of mine, he just got his daughter fixed. The Bananika is going to be next year. I said, why would you bother? Once you get fixed, you feel obliged to say, no, they're not going to speak. Okay, alhamdulillah, if they don't speak, it's fine. Right? Now, you get married, and then there's a ruksati. Sometimes you have to do that, but unless you absolutely have to, I would think that I've seen more harms in that. I don't know, do you agree with that, Mullah? There's probably more harms in that because you're like half married. You're like half married, you're not there. And a lot of your communication is on WhatsApp or on the phone. But no, WhatsApp, right? Or something else. And what happens is it's a very sensitive time. You can't really articulate yourself fully because if I'm going to speak to you and I say something even a bit bitter but I see it with a smile, it's going to be tolerable. If I say that same words, if I use the same words on WhatsApp, you're not going to see the body language with it. So you're like, oh, she hates me now. Or he hates me now. It's precarious. It's not a good idea. I know the Prophet ﷺ did ruksati after two years. Or more than that, actually. He got married to Aisha radiallahu anha. But then it was because she was young. She was six when he got married. And then at nine was the ruksati afterwards in Makkah. But there was a reason for that. We're not doing, we're not, we're not doing that here. So it's best to get married. Unless, of course, there will be cases where you have to do that. But that would, those should be far and, uh, you know, and not, not normal. How, yeah. does the, how does the husband deal with conflict between the wife and the mother? 
his own mother. Yeah. So you, you see, th there's a special chemistry there, right? The mother-in-law on her own, between her, her, between women, like she's perfect. She's got no problem. She's a, you know, Buhari kala she, right? Buhari bai she, you know, like she's good. The daughter as well among people is fine. But when you put the two together, there's this weird di dynamic. And the reason is that it's a, it's a competition for possession. The mother thinks that I've brought my son up all this time. I'm the woman of his life. And suddenly what's this woman come along and like he's more inclined to her. It's a huge problem of uh, possessiveness. So the husband has the most difficult role. And I've given some suggestions in the book that you have to please your mother and focus on her and not neglect your wife entirely and then focus on your wife and not neglect your mother entirely. You have to play it both ways. You have to be very savvy. And if you can't be, you're going to mess it up. So it's literally, you can't... Your mother will tell you things about your wife. Uh, you know, you'll know this from experience that your wife does... You've not seen that as a problem in your wife. But your mother highlights a certain point. And then you're like, yeah, that is an issue. It wasn't an issue to you before. It only became an issue because somebody highlighted it as an issue. Shaitan is there as well. You have to be deaf to that, those things. Anything valid, you must take care of it and say, okay, apologize. But you must be basically deaf to both sides like that. And then you must praise one another. So you must praise your wife in front... Uh, no, you, you must tell your mother that your wife is praising her and saying good things about her. Because this is Islah. And this is where you're allowed to be flexible with the reality. Right? And it's a very difficult game, but with a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you have to, then you're gonna, uh, the, one of the best ideas is to actually live separately. That is one of the best things that so many people can do. If you're in the same house, that's a recipe for disaster if they cannot get along together. And it's her right anyway to be given a separate apartment. Are you guys waiting for others to ask the question or what? To be honest, there are so many issues. Uh, for example, one, I just mentioned last one if you have no more questions, but the children here, but the intimacy issue is a massive one, especially nowadays. There are so many marriages which are on the rocks because of that. And I'm going to say it symbolically like that because, mashallah, we have uh, other segments of our community here who um, we may not be relevant to yet. But sometimes a couple will, or a person will come to you and say, I've got these issues. And you think, how can you have a problem with your wife or husband because of these issues? They're too small. Like, what are you talking about? No decent person is going to have such a big issue because of these small issues you're mentioning. Those are surface issues. They don't want to tell you. They're not confident. They're embarrassed to tell you the underlying issue. Especially nowadays with the fitna that's outside. So I will say in general, whatever is halal, and if your partner wants to do it, you should do it. You should contribute to it. You should be open about these things. You should have frank discussions about these things. There have been people who have written to us saying, I can't be satisfied, but I can't tell him. Right? I can't tell him. And the man is not sensitive to it. Our deen, alhamdulillah, you know in Europe, this kind of study is only about 70, 80 years old. I'm not joking. There's an explosion. It's hyper problem right now. I'm really speaking in code words here, but I hope you understand. Here, it's a big issue. But if you looked about a hundred years ago, there were some fundamental aspects of this whole thing that they didn't even understand. There was no research about it. But we, in our tradition, there's hadith about this that speak how the one should actually entertain the other and prepare the other and not just basically go in for the kill. Right? In fact, if you look at Ibn Qudam as al-Mughni, right, who's a great Hanbali scholar, right? and he has written many adab of the thing, which you'd be surprised, like, wow, how can they be so graphic about these things and so concerned about this, fulfilling each, one, each other's rights? So that is causing such a huge... Because 
it's so available outside at work and other places if at home you're not you're not getting the what you want in the halal way of course there's husbands who want the haram sometimes they're involved in haram and their wife's in and he's on the video on the computer you know you got all of these issues actually that's another one you're going to be prepared for marriage you've got these problems you don't think marriage is going to be the antidote to these problems they sometimes not because what you're seeing there is totally different from the reality so anyway, I'll just keep it like that because, but that's important. So anyway, increase your love bank accounts and those who are not married, get prepared for marriage in the proper way. It'll only prepare you as a human person, that's it. That is what's really important. Jazakallah khair. Any? Khadam Gardam? Ji. Yeah, mobile phone. You know, we had like one hour to discuss everything, so we've lost, we've left so many. These are all big issues. The mobile phone is another big issue. So, you know, when I said that if your problem is that you're addicted to your football or your YouTube, well, if you're addicted to your mobile phones. Subhanallah, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the wives would come and complain about their husbands that they wouldn't come to bed because they were doing worship. That was the complaint time of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, there's a husband who came to me. He's a very dignified member of the community. And he said, my wife's always on WhatsApp. Cooking, in bed, whatever. Right? He's always on WhatsApp. I was like, look at the times have changed. There's one person, one woman, she came to Umar radiallahu anh. Ya Amir al-Mu'minin. She had, in, I can't remember the lines of the poetry, but in poetry, she said, my husband, he, he is so into his uh, salat and Quran and everything that his side stays away from the bed and he never comes to bed and everything like that. So Umar said, MashaAllah, wah, wah, that's wonderful. Right. So there was a tabi'i, I forget his name, he was sitting there and he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, she's not praising her husband, she's complaining about her husband. Right? So Amir al-Mu'mineen said, okay, fine, if she's complaining, then you, you be the judge, you arbitrate the matter. So he had the husband called. So the husband is also a poet. And he says, yes, my love for this surah and that surah keeps me away and I'm in my worship and everything. And then she responds and she says, uh, make sure that you don't get deceived by him. Make sure you do the right decision and so on and so forth. So the decision of this tabi'i was that, okay, I'm going to, you are allowed three days to, three nights to ibadat. But one night you must be with your wife. So you've got every fourth night you must be with your wife. Three nights you must be, you can do ibadat if you want. So Umar al said, Mashallah, that's a great judgment. What's your reasoning behind it? He said, well, he is allowed to marry four wives. And in those days, they used to do that, right? He's chosen not to. So the three, and if he did have four wives, he'd have to spend one night with each of them separately. So one would only get chance every four nights anyway. So because he's chosen not to, he can spend that for ibadat instead. He can give preference to ibadat and come for the fourth night there. Those were the complaints that were coming then. And mashallah, now you got the complaints the other way around about wives as well. I'm not saying the men are free of this. The men also have problems. We, in fact, we get more problems with men. So the, the, the phone is a huge problem. And it's only going to get worse, by the way. Because the technology is soon, I wouldn't have to come here. Right? Soon, I will be in that mihrab, but I'll be in London. They've already got, it's, they can broadcast you in many places around the world, including shadows and everything. Right, so eventually I'd be able to give a bayan in 10 places at once, or 100 places at once. Now you can see how Dajjal is going to go all around the world. Wallahu alam. It's already here. This, this, there's a box, it's like, it looks like a phone box. Right, and it looks so realistic because they show their sh as though you're really there moving around in there. You're actually moving around somewhere else, but you're, you're projected in there like a real life 3D with the shadows and everything. So it's only going to get worse. And already... The, the whole augmented reality and virtual reality headsets and everything is causing huge problems because you can literally indulge in whatever desires you want. Whatever shaitan you want to be with, you can be with them. So if you don't get a grip on the whole social media problem, in terms of the adab of it, it's, it's only going to get worse. And that's why we have to get a grip of it. May Allah help us. May Allah help us. Okay, jazakallah khair, barakallah feekum. And inshallah, will, uh, Allah bless us all, inshallah.